Okay, Harriet, that is all yours. Take it away. Okay, lovely. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, it's lovely to see so many people are interested in arthritis. Um, I get quite passionate about it, so I might be using my hands quite a lot when I'm talking. Um, thank you. I know quite a few people have registered, but are going to be watching this on demand. So anyone that's watching on demand and you've got some questions, then obviously please, um, please follow up with me because I'm more than happy to, to take questions. So um, what I'm hoping today is to give you guys a lot of power, a lot of knowledge, um, so you can help you, so helping you so you can help your dog. So taking you through things that you can help identify potentially um, what's going on with your dog. If, you, if there is a diagnosis of some sort, then we can help slow down that progression and really sort of manage the situation. So I'm guessing that some of you, um, if you're here today, it's because you're obviously interested in, in helping your dogs and you've I'm guessing that so quite a few have got different knowledge about arthritis. So I'm hoping that, as I say, what I'm able to share with you this evening helps you. So um, just so you know kind of who I am, some random woman kind of talking to you through your computer or through your um, iPhone this evening. Um, Steve, my partner, tends to kind of refer to me as this crazy dog lady. Um, wasn't necessarily the, the lady that he thought he was going to be um, getting involved with 13 years ago when we first got together. But um, I was kind of a bit of a crazy dog child, as you can see on these two kind of top photographs here. Um, I grew up with, with dogs. Um, we used to puppy walk, guide dogs for the blind. Um, and we had a variety of different from, of breeds, a lot of golden retrievers, but also Labradors, German Shepherds. So we had lots of different, uh, different breeds. Um, and then in later later life uh, this guy here Jensen on the bottom left hand side he was Steve and I's first dog together and he basically changed our lives and changed my career so I had 20 odd years in IT marketing um, and Jensen had um, a few issues which I'll cover um, a little bit during this talk but um, he basically changed everything for me so I kind of got a bit obsessed um, I wanted to help him myself um, started learning massage just to help him and then I kind of actually got a bit obsessed and wanting to help him even more and uh, ended up retraining and becoming a, an animal uh, or a vet physiotherapist. Some people say animal physio, some people say vet physio, basically the same thing. Um, and I specialise in dogs. Um, Jensen sadly no longer with us, we lost him far too early um, at the age of five. Nothing to do with arthritis I should say at this point. Um, something very, very uh, separate, disconnected to that. But, um, but as I say, I'm forever grateful to, for Jensen for setting me on this, this, uh, this animal therapy journey, which I absolutely love. So we're now proud owners of Baxter. Um, he's this uh, golden retriever on the bottom right. He's a rescue dog um, and he has a few behavior challenges. So it's completely different to Jensen. Um, and it's actually through Baxter, so it's how I, know, um, how I know Adam. And say thank you, Adam, for, for arranging this, this, um, this talk this evening. So um, I'm based um, in Froome, which is not far from Longleat, if you know where that is. Um, and I also see some dogs up in Woking, Surrey, which is where I'm from originally. So I'll, I'll uh, but I'll travel around. Um, I also do some online consults and that type of thing. So uh, location doesn't necessarily always matter. But as I say, my my main mission and the one of the reasons that I got into all of this is because I've been that owner that's had that kind of conversation with the vet saying your dog's got arthritis, and I was like oh my God, what can I do? And I, I see it sometimes in, in owners when I speak to them. And, you know, hopefully what I'm going to be able to share with you this evening is that there is so much you can do as an owner. There's so many things you can do. And it's, it's but sometimes people just don't know where the information is. So I'm hoping that say some of the things that I can cover with you this evening just empowers you. So you can start to ask more questions. You can start to look around and, um, and you know, it's to say, it's not, it's not, it's not always bad news. It's to say, there's so many things that can be done and, you know, a lot of people don't always know what arthritis is and what the causes are and that type of thing because no one really tells you unless you've got that sort of you've got that level of knowledge from from elsewhere. And so as I say what I'm hoping that I can cover with the view this evening that you can kind of walk away thinking, actually, I can do this. We can I can help my dog. So I just wanted to do a quick slide on what physiotherapy is, because hopefully then it puts into um, context some of the other content that I'll be showing a bit later. But um, physiotherapy is, is, is basically helping a dog or helping ourselves heal better. 
So as, as humans, we have an amazing, and dogs, we have an amazing ability to heal. So if I cut my, you know, if I cut myself, my body will just, will heal that. If I um, break my leg, then it would actually do a bodge job, but it would heal. Um, but, uh, you know, normally you have a, a, an operation or something like that. Um, but so say I broke my, my, you know, the bottom of my leg, then it would be obviously the bottom of my leg that hurts, but also the rest of my body would start to compensate. So if you know if something hurts and you start to change the way you move so you would then start to compensate you would shift your weight slightly more to different positions you would be using and holding yourself differently so when we think about physiotherapy it's very much looking at the whole of the body so not just dealing with the issue of, of maybe something's wrong with the hip you, you don't just look at their hip you're looking at the whole the whole body and when you're dealing with something like osteoarthritis, it's really, it's really about giving that dog the best quality of life that you can possibly do. You're giving them the best possible chance. So you're helping them, enable them to use their bodies more effectively um, and be able to kind of basically sort of deal with, with the, whatever, whatever the challenges may be. There's so many things that can be done to basically help that dog. So when you're, when, from, as a physiotherapist perspective, Another thing to be really kind of mindful of is that all dogs are different. You know, I, I put that thing there saying, you know, dogs are like snowflakes. And I don't mean that they're flaky. I mean that they're, they're all individuals. So the way that one dog will cope with something and or they'll receive a treatment will be different maybe to another dog. So if I see two dogs with maybe the same condition, I wouldn't necessarily treat them in exactly the same way because it would be very dependent on so many things. So how old they are what breed they are what what progression is, is is the condition at and it will just be around you know what is right for that particular dog and with <clears throat> physiotherapy it tends to be covered in it tends to cover sort of three main sort of buckets if you like and i won't go into all of the details of all of these things but it's just to give you a bit of an idea about this type of approach so Manual therapies, I'm a big fan of. So that's all about using our hands. So lots of massage, soft tissue, mobilization, range of motion. So getting things moving with our hands. And, you know, we have a great ability with our hands. You know, these are healing. These are healing tools that we have at our, at our disposal. So there's so many things that we can do with just using our hands. One of the things that I like to do with owners as well is to, uh, I give them homework in between, in between um, sessions a lot of the time. And so in the form of therapeutic exercises. So again, we're trying to retrain, retrain sometimes the way a dog is moving. So if something hurts, then, you know, they're going to move in a certain type of way, but over a period of time, hopefully it's going to hurt less, but sometimes they might still think, oh, well, I, actually I've always walked like this so I'm going to carry on but it's like no let's try and retrain let's try and get them to move their body in the right kind of way so there's some therapeutic exercises that you can do to help that and another one is um, therapeutic equipment and I won't necessarily use all of these on every single dog but these are pieces of uh, equipment that I sometimes use if I feel it's right for the dog so there's light therapy, there's um, pulse magnet, um, there's ultrasound, there's a whole load of other things. And in fact, if you went onto Amazon and you put in, I've got back pain, you'd probably get a whole load of devices that came up to say that they could you know, help cure. So I, I tend to use um, uh, equipment that I have personally seen um, a big difference in a dog. Um, and to say, I won't use them all of the time, but they are at my, at my disposal if I need to. And I kind of got, I say, I, I see, I see arthritis so commonly in, in dogs and I wanted to do my own research project, which I did last year. And just to kind of put some, a bit more sort of hard facts behind, um, behind basically what I'm saying. And when I saw just over three sessions over dogs um, that took part in my, in my project, I saw that we were looking at the mobility of the dog and also their overall well-being. And I got the owners involved as well. So they were helping to, um, to see, you know, see the changes in their dogs. And we saw that the mobility, so how that dog is moving, that was improving by up to, um, and sometimes over 30%. And then the well-being, so how, how well is that dog? How are they feeling? How happy are they? Are they more playful? And that we saw improvements at, um, by up to 25% in the dogs. And so that was really, really lovely and encouraging because, you know, as I say, it's all very well me saying, yeah, it works, but actually, you know, owners could see it and it was, um, it was, it was clear that it was working. And, I can there's a link on my website um, if you wanted to read a bit more about that study 
So another quick thing to really be clear about is um, as a physio, I can't diagnose. Um, I can't tell you which medication or anything like that to be on. Um, that's for, that's, that would be for a vet. It's actually against the law for me to do that. Um, and as also by law, I have to get um, vet consent or vet, vet referral um, to be able to actually get my hands on your dog. So if someone said, oh, Harriet, can you come and see my dog? Um, then uh, I'd have to contact the vet. They no, normally always say that's okay. Um, and, uh, and so it's, um, it's about a, sort of like a team approach, if you like, and I'll cover the teamwork element a bit later. But um, it's just to be clear, because sometimes people say, why have you got to ask my vet? Um, and it's just because it's, it's a legal requirement. Ooh. Harriet, um, sorry yeah. to interrupt. Could I just get you to let in a couple of latecomers down in the participations yeah. box, please? Okay, yeah. There's one there. Jen. Perfect. So she's there. No Brilliant. Way. Hey, no worries. Okay, hi Jen. You just missed a very just maybe about five minutes, and you can watch it on catch up if you if you need to. So, this evening. So, as I say, hopefully that just gives you a bit of background of who I am, um, and uh, from a physiotherapy, just a brief overview of what physiotherapy is all about. So, this evening, what I'm hoping to cover in the next forty or so minutes is. Um, a basic introduction to what osteoarthritis is, so what sometimes are the causes of that, um, what are the signs, so as an owner what can you start to look for, um, and then more importantly you know what can you guys do. So um, what I'm going to share is uh, is relevant for all dog breeds and, and ages, um, it can be affected, you know arthritis can affect, I've seen dogs at six months old that have got arthritis um, all the way up to 15, 16, 17 year olds so it, it really can cover a really wide age gap and, um, and so I'll cover breeds in a second but um, so but the, but the, the kind of information I'm going to be giving you is relevant for all and as I say hopefully I don't want to kind of be the, um, the sort of voice of doom when it comes to some of this stuff um, because it can sometimes sound a little bit scary when you say the word arthritis and you kind of think oh my gosh you know but um, but I say as owners we have a huge amount of power and um, and we have a huge amount of ability to be really proactive in, in, in our dog's life so um, so hopefully as I say this isn't about worrying you hopefully this is about encouraging you about realizing how much you can do yourselves. <clears throat> so what is osteoarthritis? Well, um, the one thing to be kind of aware of is it's actually incredibly common. And uh, Adam actually asked me a couple of weeks ago about, you know, well, how many people, how many dogs are actually um, are affected by it? And it's, it, it's actually quite a difficult number to give because a lot of the time it's actually underreported. But, um, you know, at the moment in the UK, there's just under 10 million dogs out there, which is, for me, is fantastic. I love the fact that there's so many dogs around. but um, Various sources sort of give us that there's, it's between about 30 and 50 percent of dogs um, at some point in their lifetime are going to be affected by osteoarthritis at some point. Um, so it's common. Um, you know, that's when um, I say when it's being recorded, it's one of the top reasons, um, I say one of the most um, common musculoskeletal disorder. I can never say that word properly. Um, and, you know, referral centers. So if you go to see your vet, you may be referred to a specialist, um, so a referral centre. And normally, you know, high numbers between 60 to 80 percent a lot of the time of the conditions that they're treating. So it may not be, OK, I'm coming to you because I've got osteoarthritis. They may be coming to the referral centre for something else. But actually, osteoarthritis is a byproduct of that. So, um, so, so that's why sometimes it's hard to get um, to get really uh, kind of exact figures. But as I say, it is common you know it, it happens and, and I would say most of the clients that I'm seeing at the moment I think pretty much all of them have got osteoarthritis I'm pretty sure that's right at the moment actually and certainly when you look at some of the breeds that are most commonly affected um, unfortunately some breeds are predisposed so it's kind of in their genetics um, that they will at some point have, have a, you know have arthritis um, as dog age, um, it's kind of a natural progression, a bit like it is with us, you know, with us humans. Um, I think I read somewhere recently that actually in, in humans, it's the, your thumb is the first place that you actually get osteoarthritis. So, you know, I don't know whether I've got it in there or not. I may have, I may not. But, um, but as I say, it's, it's common, you know, a lot of humans have it, um, a lot of dogs have it. Um, so as I say, it's, 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 
it's, uh, it's, it's something that um, it's not sort of unheard of. Uh, <clears throat> and then sadly, this is always a, um, a statistic that I always kind of get upset about really when I, when I hear about it is that, um, you know, again, quite recent um, indications have been that osteoarthritis can actually be one of the main reasons that dogs are actually put to sleep, um, maybe earlier than, than, um, than maybe we, they could have been, um, just because of, as I say, well, lots of different reasons, but it's, uh, it's, it, it's so painful if, if it's missed, it can, it, it can cause so much pain um, that uh, you can start to see sort of um, what we call sort of unwanted behaviours. So I'm sure Adam has, um, has kind of experienced unwanted behaviours in dogs in, in the work that he does. But, uh, you know, if dogs hurt, um, they will start to change the way they behave. So, you know, if I've got a splitting headache for, for three days, then I'm going to be a bit grumpy. Um, you know, I'm going to get a bit fed up or... So it, it's natural that if, if a dog is feeling uncomfortable, then they will start to change the way they behave. But as I say, that's why as owners, we have um, so much, um, so much sort of power in our hands that we can actually make, you know, with, through some of the lifestyle ch uh, changes or, or um, decisions that we make for our dogs, then we can really have an influence on, on the progression and potentially, you know, have our dogs in our lives for a lot longer. You know, we always want our dogs around for as long as we possibly can. So, um, we really do have that influence and that was backed up again recently by uh, the Royal Veterinary College um, saying you know that owners do have that um, have that ability to really help their dogs by keeping them fit and healthy um, we can really we can really make a difference so I think sometimes it's easier to kind of like see something as opposed to actually sort of read or hear someone like me talking about a condition so at the top here on this photo that hopefully you can all see okay, um, we've got a really nice healthy looking joint. So this is a knee joint and you'll see here this white area which is the lovely smooth cartilage. So that's providing cushioning. So when that dog is bending and flexing its, um, its, its knee, you've got this nice smooth lovely cartilage, nice and shiny, and that's providing a really nice cushion for that dog. So that's moving in a really, really nice way. But what can happen over time is that uh, this cartilage, this nice, shiny, lovely cartilage can start to break down. And so I mentioned earlier on about how the dog, you know, how our bodies have an amazing ability to heal. And, and this is kind of an example of it. So in, uh, when the body kind of registers that something's a bit unstable, what it will do is it'll actually grow extra bits of bone. So these are called osteophytes. And these funny little sort of bubbles here that's actually that's actually extra bits of bone that the body's saying okay so i haven't got enough cartilage anymore that's going to provide this cushioning so what i'm going to do is i'm actually going to grow extra bits of bone instead that's hopefully going to give us some some um, some some stability there and so what ends up happening over time is that that cartilage ends up breaking away and then when that dog is moving that that joint or the same breakdown in, in humans what actually ends up happening is that you've got bone on bone and that's what causes the pain that's what causes the the um, inflammation so osteo means bone and itis means inflammation so that's why it's called osteoarthritis um, the other thing to mention is that um, there are other forms of arthritis that dogs can get. Um, so there's rheumatoid, aseptic, and there's a few others, but it's just that osteoarthritis is the most common that we see. It's uh, sometimes, depending on who you're talking to, um, sometimes it's referred to as DJD, so that means degenerative joint um, disease. And if it's happening in the spine, then it's most, not, it's not, most normally called spondylosis. And again, humans can get this. There may be some people that are listening tonight, they have it maybe. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's, there's, there's sometimes the words that, um, that are sometimes used. As I say, it's basically an inflammation of the joint. And when something doesn't operate properly, um, you, the dog will then start to not use it properly. And then it's not just affecting that particular joint, it then starts to affect everything around it. So all of the muscles, all of the tendons, all the ligaments, etc. So the main, uh, there's two kind of like areas really of the, what the main causes are. So um, as I mentioned earlier on, you know, so just age, um, you know, wear and tear. Uh, as I say, some breeds are predisposed to it. Um, and then secondary cause, which was just a little bit more common, is if there's any kind of like trauma to that joint. 
So if, for instance, uh, there has to be an operation for any particular reason, which I'll cover in a second, but if there's any, if there's any, um, any uh, surgery that has to happen on that particular joint, if there isn't arthritis already present there, what will happen is that trauma to that, to that joint will actually mean inevitably that there will be, um, there will be arthritis there. So um, that's, let's say, that's what, uh, quite a common reason. Um, some of you may have heard of hip dysplasia. Some of you may have heard of elbow dysplasia. Um, so dysplasia means abnormality of development. So it's an, the, the joint doesn't quite um, form properly. So that's, again, another reason why um, osteoarthritis would be unfortunately inevitable, which I will cover now. <clears throat> so uh, as I say, I hear this a lot and I, I see it a lot in dogs um, and sometimes again it's sometimes easier to kind of you hear these words and you think well, what does it really mean what does it um, really cover so on this left hand side here we've got um, an x-ray of normal looking hips so the hip joint is a ball and socket so the top of the thigh bone fits nicely into that socket and so if you think your dog with its back leg has to go backwards it has to go forwards it cock its legs, it has to go outwards. So it's got a really big range of motion. And when that fit, when that, um, when that joint is formed properly, then that's a really nice, so it's, a, it's got a full, it's got a full mobility. But what can happen, unfortunately, is that that joint doesn't always develop correctly. And what ends up happening, which is what we're seeing on the bottom right hand, um, sorry, the bottom left, is that that ball isn't fitting properly into that socket. So what ends up happening is that this, this x-ray here was, was a dog of about seven months or so. Um, and what was happening was every time she was walking, actually it was luxating. So the hip was actually coming out of the, out of the socket. And that's just because um, it just hasn't formed correctly. What normally happens is both hips are affected. It's just that one tends to be more, um, tends to be worse than the other. So that's kind of a very quick overview of what hip dysplasia is. And then on the right hand side is the elbow. So um, as a joint, this is a much more complicated joint. It's mainly because the fact that it's a different kind of joint. So if you think the ball and, the ball and socket is the hip joint, so that's that, that does one kind of set of motion, but with an elbow, it's more of a hinge joint. And you've actually got there, so this is the, an x-ray of, a, of a, a dog's elbow. So you've got the humerus here, and that's going down into this area here. And so you've actually got the meeting of three bones. And that's why it can be a little bit more of a complicated um, condition. And there's different, uh, different references to um, there's about five or six, I think, different types. So sometimes it's called elbow dysplasia. Other times people actually call it elbow disease because sometimes it's not just the actual physical joint. Sometimes it's the cartilage around it that is the issue. Um, but as I say, it's, uh, elbow dysplasia tends to be the general name for, um, for different conditions. And things like uh, medial uh, coronary process, um, that's a, a really common one where basically the bottom of the humerus, so if you think it's a bit like... Um, a uh, bottom sitting on a, on, a, on a saddle on a horse and if that bottom doesn't fit properly on that saddle what ends up happening is that you kind of you get saddle sore basically and that's that's a really common one um, for, for elbows and bits break off and it gets to rub and it's not very nice so um, so they're they're quite often um, two um, conditions that I see and as I say if if arthritis isn't there at the beginning, so as that, as that joint is forming, if arthritis isn't there straight, you know, well, it won't be there straight away, but over a period of time, then unfortunately it is inevitable that, that arthritis will form there. This is why I mean about not wanting to be doom and gloom. So hopefully I'm trying to keep it, it positive here. So as I say, because there are lots of things you can do. So um, the knee or the stifle joint, that's again, another really common uh, joint that is affected with dogs. Um, some of you may have had, um, heard of cruciate ligaments. Um, Steve, my partner, he, um, he actually had cruciate ligament um, operation um, a few years ago and he kind of jokes that he had to wait 18 months for his operation and our previous dog Jensen only had to wait 18 hours basically <laughs> to have his operation done. But, um, but what can happen with the knee joint is, so you've got the, the thigh bone at the top and then you've got the, the lower leg here. 
And what the cruise ship does, it stabilizes, it's a, it's a, it's a cross and it stabilizes that joint. And what can happen, it's normally the front, the front part, because it's a cross, normally what can happen is that, that front part over a period of time will start to wear down, you know, dog's getting older, it's plodding along, and just gradually over time, it will just quite often just partially, partially tear, and you'll start to see your dog limp. But what can also happen is sometimes it just wears down, wears down, wears down, wears down, and then it just snaps. Or other times is that your dog can be running along and maybe they've I've seen it happen with dogs, um, you know, they run around a tree or they go, you know, they're out, if they're a gun dog and they're out running and they go into the bushes to flush something out and then they come out and then all of a sudden they're limping, you know, they cut, they're, it, it, they've literally gone from being absolutely fine to suddenly it's gone and they're, you know, they can't even put any weight on that knee. So that's not because it's completely ruptured. Um, so it literally just snaps and that's why it becomes unstable and that's why your dog won't want to put its foot down. Um, so that's again a really uh, common condition that would then lead to osteoarthritis again if it's not already present and another one that can happen is this here is the patella so that's basically the kneecap and what the kneecap does is it sits in that hopefully you can see my cursor okay um, it sits in that groove there and what can happen is I say normally it would move nicely within that groove as that dog is, is using its leg but what can happen is if that groove isn't quite, if it's maybe too, it's not too much like that, it's more, it's more flat, um, it can actually sort of start to pop to the side. So sometimes it pops on the outside and other times it will pop in onto the inside. So it's quite common in sort of little terriers and sort of slightly smaller dogs. So you might see a dog like running, 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 and then they'll do a funny little skip and then you'll see them kind of like going on three legs. And then that's actually, the kneecaps come out and then it's going back in. So that's normally the kind of the action that they're doing. Um, and again, if arthritis isn't already there, then um, then it will it will form. And then I mentioned earlier one um, spondylosis. So this is um, this is when it's uh, there's um, arthritis in the spine. Uh, this is actually Jensen, our, our previous dog. Um, he had the early signs of it. So this is the bottom part of a dog. So this is the pelvis here. That's the the hip joint that we were talking about earlier, the ball and socket. And then just where this arrow is, you can see this kind of like lower bit of stuff. And that's basically extra bone that's starting to grow. So we saw in the earlier slides about how, you know, the body's very care, uh, clever at sort of starting to kind of grow new bone. And what happens with spondylosis is that it starts to, they call it bridging. So basically what's happening is that those vertebrae, instead of being separate, they then start to fuse. So this is the early stages there and then what it will do is it will do that vertebrae then it will go along and it will bridge that one and then it can gradually work its way up the spine. So that's that's what arthritis looks like when it's in the spine. So <clears throat> this is um, Jensen, I say our previous, the love of my life. Um, uh, so say forever, ever grateful to the lovely Jensen. So um, I wanted to put this slide up or this photograph of him for a couple of different reasons mainly to just kind of um kind of explain like i say we talk about the progression of how um as i say unfortunately there's no cure to arthritis but it um it's a progressive disease and what can happen is over a period of time it can start to change and it can start to move to different parts of the body so with jensen it started most likely in his in his knees in his cruciate so uh, at the age of maybe probably earlier than I say I didn't if only I knew then what I know now he was probably around about a year old maybe even slightly younger um, and he was he was always quite weak at his back end his, his his strength was always at the front one kind of thing to mention actually just from a confirmation perspective dogs uh, their front their front legs kind of are their brakes basically and the back end so their their hind limbs are, are is their engine so we always want their sort of back end to be to be strong so we could, it helps propel them forward we don't really want a dog kind of pulling themselves along that so they're, they're sort of designed to be strong at the uh, strong at the back and then say the, the front limbs are, are kind of like the brakes so as I say with Jensen what most likely happened was it started um, in his cruise ship so he had um, a partial tear um, and then which we did operate on um, and then over a period of time as I say he started to develop it in his um, in his 
in his lower spine, so the, the x-ray um, a, a moment ago was spondylosis, so that was his spine. Um, and then, not that we had x-rays of this, but then we could start to notice that there were then um, arthritic changes happening in his hips, um, and then, then in his elbows. And the reason for that is, if a dog feels uncomfortable at his back end, what it's naturally gonna do is push its weight forward. So naturally dogs would carry 60% on their front end and 40% on their back end. That's, that's a kind of a, a normal kind of percentage. But what will end up happening, and it was very much the case with Jensen, was that he was, he was always weak on his back end. So, and you'll see the way he's standing. So normally in a golden retriever, you'd want that, that back part of their back to be much longer. You'd want those legs to be much further back. But what he's actually doing here is he's really tucking under his pelvis because he's wanting to take weight off his back legs. <clears throat> and it's maybe hopefully a little bit clear, but what he's actually doing is that when he's standing, he's actually resting. He's actually resting his back right leg. So he's kind of leaning over like this. And what ends up happening was, was with Jensen was that his front left leg was then compensating for his back right leg because they tend to compensate opposite so uh say so, so over a period of time it kind of started in one place but then as it progressed over a period of time um uh, as i say it started to go forwards and the reason i say if only i knew then what i knew now is because i know there were so many things that i could have done that i didn't because i didn't know and that's why i've always felt so passionate about really helping owners is to you know as I say, there's so many things you can do and um, it, it really can have an effect as to how, how quickly and how fast things that can progress. So now we've gone all, kind of gone into that, it's like, okay, well, what are, you know, what are the signs? Um, how do I know, you know, how do I know if my dog's got arthritis? Um, maybe you already do know, or maybe you're thinking, oh, you know, what's going on? So dogs are amazing at covering up pain. So they don't want to show that they're in pain. Obviously they can't talk. Um, so the only way that they can communicate with us is the way they move and the way they behave. So what I always encourage owners to do is, you know, start to look how your dog moves. So when you're maybe watching them potter around the garden first thing in the morning, or when you're seeing them get up out of bed, when you're going out on a walk um, and you're, you know, you're basically maybe they're just sort of like pottering along next to you um, or maybe they're starting to run you know how do they how do they move and the reason I kind of want you to kind of start to look at things like that is because then you can start to judge is what is normal for your dog because then if you then start to things see things change you're like ah oh, okay so they look like actually they're starting to are they limping you know you start to kind of think okay what's going on here or are they not wanting to put weight so much on certain parts of their body so you know you on that on that photograph of Jensen you know he was shifting his weight forward he was resting that back right leg so you know start to sort of start to see things like that and if it, if it makes it easier then do a video you know I quite often do video, I've got, in fact I've got thousands of videos of dogs but it's always quite a useful sort of gauge to have is to keep a diary you know even if it's just I don't know once a month or something just to start to see how your dog is moving and so then you can say start to say possibly see what what the differences may be so you might start to see that they start to nod their heads um, that can be an indication of something going on sometimes in, in the front end so they, they won't want to take um, you know they'll try and take uh, weight off so they'll tend to, hot, um, to nod up and then when they're good legs on the on the ground, then they'll start to nod down. So you'll start to see a bit of a nodding motion going on there. You might start to see that they're not wanting to jump up. You might think, oh, okay, they're not jumping up on the sofa so much anymore. They're not jumping up on my bed. Or when they're running up the stairs, they're, they're looking at, like they're bunny hopping. Um, they might not want to be jumping into the car anymore. Or they might be, you know, they'll do it because they want to go out on a walk. But maybe they're starting to hesitate a little bit more. And so just start to look at, you know, what, how your dog moves and then are you starting to notice changes because all of these things they all help piece kind of pieces the puzzle together so i say i really really encourage that <clears throat> and then um as i say if a dog is in discomfort and by the way i should say as well 
those things are indications of basically discomfort. It doesn't mean that your dog has definitely got arthritis. It's just, as they say, common things are common. So it's just that if they start to change the way they move, it's very commonly because of arthritis, but it may be other things. So, but the main thing is, 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 it, is that you're starting to notice. Um, and as I kind of alluded to a bit earlier on, you know, dogs will start to change the way they behave. So, you know, if I walk along and I stub my foot, it's like, ah, that hurts, you know? So I might get, you know, if someone then says to me, oh, Harriet, can you do this? It's like, oh no, I'm coping with my foot, it hurts. But, you know, I'll give it a rub and it's all fine. You know, a few minutes later, it's normally fine. But if you have chronic pain, so some of you may have that yourself, a friend of mine's got a really bad painful shoulder at the moment. And, you know, over a period of time, that starts to really, really hurt. And chronic pain is, 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 is horrible. It's, it's a horrible, horrible type of pain because the slightest thing that never used to really hurt can then start to really, really hurt. So again, start to look at how your dog is behaving. So, um, you know, when they're getting up in the morning, are they starting to pant? And you think that's weird because it's not hot. They haven't just done some exercise. You know, what, what's going on there? Or, you know, are they, if there's someone at the front door, or maybe when you come back from work or come back from shopping, what have you, you know, you normally your dog will be running up and wanting to greet you. And then all of a sudden you're noticing that actually they're not doing that anymore. They're just still staying in their bed. They, you know, they don't, they don't really want to get up. Um, you know, maybe they're not wanting to be touched anymore. So they may have cuddled up with you on the sofa and you used to stroke them and then you start to get closer to maybe the hip area or their back end. And then all of a sudden they're like, no, I don't want you to do that. Or maybe they've gone to the groomers and the groomers said, oh yeah, I was just doing this and they, they didn't like it. Um, or they may be start to obsessively lick parts of them. So they might be like really sort of um, licking parts of their, some of their different joints. So there's lots of different things to start to sort of monitor as to, um, uh, to say start to see behavior changes and again I don't want to panic you so if your dog's suddenly panting you think oh my god oh my god they've got arthritis you know it, it doesn't actually mean that it's just these are sort of typical types of things that you start to see when a dog is becoming more uncomfortable so again just making a note of these things starting to be a bit more aware um, because as I say they can be indications and they most likely are indications that there's there's a level of discomfort there and you have to kind of play detective sometimes it's not always really really obvious where the issue is um, but as I say when you start to think about okay are they starting to move differently and are they starting to um, act differently they normally come in combination there's a really good chance that there's something going on there so as an owner, you know, you say, okay, you, so you start to notice that something's changing in the way they're moving, and then you start to notice that it's changing in, in the way that they're behaving. So you think, well, what do I do? <clears throat> so the first thing I'd always say is, me, for me, the priority is get that dog out of pain. So if there's a level of discomfort, we want to get rid of that because anything else that you try and do is so much harder if they're in pain. So you know, if I start to see dogs and I know that they're really, really painful, I'm not going to start to give them all these different therapeutic exercises that are then just going to hurt more. You know, we have to control that pain level. So, um, so the first thing I'd always say is, you know, if you're not, if you're, if you're unsure and you're not too sure, then please go to your vet. Um, if you're not sure which vet you want to speak to, because I know sometimes, especially COVID and everything, it makes it, it has been a little bit more tricky. But you know, maybe speak to your receptionist and say, look you know, my dog is doing this, that and the other, you know, which is a really good vet for me to speak to or, you know, me to, um, to come into contact with. And then you can start to build a bit, of a, a bit of a relationship with them. And so, you know, the more information you can give them, you know, my dog is starting to act like this, they're starting to move like this, it's been going on for this amount of time, it then means that they have a bit more information to be going on. And so they can start to talk to you about some kind of diagnosis and say, most importantly, pain management. I know sometimes, and I was the same. I know sometimes there can be some resistance about, um, oh, I don't want my dog on pain, you know, pain relief all of their lives and, and all the rest of it. That's a whole other kind of conversation, but please don't be scared of it because it's worse for your dog to be suffering. Um, so, so say, please have those conversations with your vet. And I would say um, at the same time, you know, start to look at for physiotherapists. And I'm not saying you have to, you have to speak to me, but, um, also more than happy to speak to you guys but you know start to look at a physiotherapist because we can um we can really start to work with you and work with the diagnosis that comes from your vet and we can then start to really build a plan that is personal to your dog um let's say the vet might say well look we need to do x-rays you know they 
they don't have x-ray visions themselves they, they can you know they can have a feel they can do a good examination and what have you but um but say they they may recommend certain different things to, to really be helping your dog so so don't you know try not to be too scared of that um it's it's normally for very good reason and i i, I know there's a whole financial situation which again i won't necessarily cover right now but um let's say the more information that we can get the better basically as i say and then we can start to really build a proper plan um i quite often suggest to pretty much most of the dogs that i know that um, have got arthritis i quite often well i say most normally um su suggest that they start doing hydrotherapy because physiotherapy and hydrotherapy working alongside with the vet can work really really well together and i think that's the thing to kind of like um be um be mindful of is that there, it's not like there's one thing that's gonna that's gonna help. It's basically a whole load of things um, happening. So this is why it's so. That's why I feel so passionate about kind of like letting owners know about what they can do because you know you spend the majority of the time with you with your dog. So what you can do can really really help them. So I say it can't arthritis can't be cured, but it can be so successfully managed. And you know I saw a dog. Um, a dog this morning actually and he's such a lovely boy and the owners have done amazing work they've done everything we've asked of them and you know he was he was in a, he was showing unwanted behavior um he was in a lot of pain and you know he's, he's doing so so well he's really living his best life now and it really warms my heart when i see him and i hadn't seen him for a while because of the whole lockdown thing and um, it's so so lovely so you know you really do have the power to to really help your dog you know as i say it's all about you know giving them the best life you know and, and and you you know as owners we get so much joy i mean you know this is baxter photograph here and you know he makes literally makes me smile every single day and you know the longer i can have in my life the better he does have as i say he, he his his joy his dip, uh, his uh, challenges are very different to jensen's but he does have arthritis so you know i can start to really think about okay i want to do the best for him so he's feeling better he's moving better he's not in pain um you know we're giving him the best quality of life we're hoping having you know hoping to have him in our lives for as, as long as possible um, we all have pets for different reasons. Sometimes they may be just a pet or maybe <clears throat> they're a working dog or a gun dog or a therapy dog. They do agility, you do hoopers. There's lots of different reasons why we have dogs in our lives. And, um, you know, the things that they do, so it's being mindful of that. It's like, okay, if they're going to do some of these activities, then we really need to make sure that we're taking care of them and giving them, you know, giving them the best chance. So I'm saying all this and it's just like, okay, well, what do I do, you know? Come on, Harriet, you're talking all this stuff. What, what am I actually going to do? <clears throat> so the next slide, I put this up on, on here, and it, I'm actually kind of secretly glad that I can't actually see everyone's faces because this is always a really tricky conversation to have um, with people. And um, I do call it the elephant in the room because uh, it's quite, uh, it's like it can sometimes be a bit of an awkward conversation. Um, everyone's opinion about this particular subject can be different. Um, their perception, um, what I see versus what somebody else will see um, can be, um, I say, can be uh, different. So I don't know whether you can guess what the topic is gonna be, but what I'm, the topic I'm about to, just about to talk about is it will have the biggest effect, either positively or negatively on your dog. That, yeah, I would say that pretty confidently. And it's weight management. So please, if, please, 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 I will, there's a slide in a second that helps give you some guidelines, but please, um, please look at your dog. Please start to look at um, their weight, their body score. Again, for me, it's not about the numbers. It's more about the look and the feel, which again, I'll give you some guidelines in a second. But there's so much evidence. It's not me just talking about it, but there's so much evidence. I've listed some here, uh, but there's plenty more out there that having our dogs at the best um, body weight is the biggest and the best thing that we can do for them. Um, there was a recent thing that came out from the Royal Veterinary College, um, like, literally, I think it was about a month ago. And they were saying that obesity, arthritis and dental disease are actually the top three welfare conditions that they have for, for dogs. So obesity and arthritis are so, so closely um, connected. So, you know, if a dog is overweight, it's basically a fast track for them to get arthritis. And if we can take that weight off them, then that is the biggest, the kindest thing that we can do for them. And it's not just because they're carrying extra load onto their joints. Fat tissue has actually got in itself 
um, inflammatory mediators. So if you think you've got inflammatory tissue surrounding a joint, so you saw earlier on about what, a, what an angry kind of arthritic joint looks like, it's basically kind of like putting fire, uh, petrol on a fire. You know, it, it's just making it worse. It's making it more painful. So um, it's, you know, it's, it's a natural form of pain relief, basically. If you can get that weight off, it's, um, it's, such, it's such a good thing to be doing. Um, it can give you, you know, it's, again, it's been proven in quite a few different studies that it can actually increase your dog's lifespan. It can, it can minimize the progression. And, you know, I look back on uh, Jensen and say, uh, the, the picture I showed a bit earlier on, you know, at his, um, you know, he was at, not necessarily in that photo quite so much, but um, at parts of his life, he, he was overweight, you know, and I, and I kind of cringe a little bit about that because um, we weren't helping him at all and we were probably speeding up the process. Um, but it can, it's been proven that it will slow down the progression. And again, there's so many other statistics about how it will reduce the symptoms. So, you know, again, it, if he, even if he didn't, if he did nothing else, it would actually stop. The, it would actually reduce um, the lameness. I think there was a study I read not that long ago about something to do with if you know if a dog's got at least ten percent um, of their body weight to lose, it's almost the equivalent of being on pain relief. So as I say, if, if nothing else, start to look at um, start to look at what your what your dog looks like. Um, and again. Physiotherapists can help sort of guide you through some of this and point you in the right direction. But um, these are some worldwide um, guidelines that uh, are out there, uh, which give. Um, so you might hear your um, your vet or other people refer to what is the body condition score of your dog, and it's graded one to nine. Um, you, I can um, give you a, a link to this, um, or you can Google it or what have you. But um, so this is great to say one to nine. So one being um, underweight, and then um, nine being overweight. And what we really want to aim for is our dogs to be around this so between four and five and really how we want to how we want them to look and there's three kind of like main overall guidelines that we can look at and if you're wondering why i've got a picture here of, of knuckles it's because um again depending on what kind of dog it is if it's got long hair short hair sometimes it's slightly easier to see um but if you ran if you run your hand over your knuckles like that that's how your that's how a dog's rib cage you should be able to feel their ribs through through their fur so again it's not pushing down and sort of rubbing to see if you can find them you should be able to feel them like this <clears throat> so if you've got your dog next to you you can start to think okay can i how easily can i feel the ribs there you can start to look at them from the side and if you want to send me photographs i can you know i can have a look at your dog um but here you want to see like again depending on the coat you want to see a nice tuck here and then from the top you want to see a nice sort of hourglass so you've got you know you've got the where the rib cage is at the, at the top end here and as it goes down it's more narrow so you want to see that sort of nice hourglass so they're the three kind of indicators so look at the dog from the top and then look at them from the side and then start to see if you can feel their ribs so I, I kind of wanted to get that one out of the way, just say, because it's it always scares me a little bit. Um, but uh, but it's it's just so important. Some other quick examples. So um, I, there are so many that um, I could go through, and I have got um, an ebook which I'll send you a link to um, at the end of this. So um, I've got about I think about nineteen sort of lifestyle sort of suggestions now um, <clears throat> that you can do. But I'm wanting to make sure that I cover like the most important. So again, um, looking at your dogs, um, so where, you know, looking at the home environment. So where does your dog spend most of their time? Um, again, I cringe. I've got videos of Jensen as a puppy sliding all over our kitchen floor. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I let him get away with it. Um, but dogs have a very limited amount of grip. So if you were to pick up your dog's paw, again, depending on the breed as to how hairy they are, you know this bit here this on the on the paw that's the only bit they've got to have any kind of form of grip and if that's then covered in lots of hair as well then we're, we're taking away the grip so if your dog is um potentially overweight if it's spending a lot of time sliding on the floor you might start to notice it's really struggling to get up you know and you're there, they're really kind of like sort of almost like backpedaling to try and get to try and get some form of grip and if they've got if they've got really long nails as well we're making it so hard for them and you know dogs can get arthritis in their digits as well so and dogs actually walk 
on their on their on their on their tiptoes and on, on their fingernails so uh, or on their fingertips rather so um not like us you know we have uh, we have our ankles on the ground dogs don't they literally walk sort of like this so we want to give them the best possible chance when they're in your home um is to give them the best chance of being able to have the most amount of grip so as i say all the time that they're slipping and sliding around with we're, we're, we're taking um we're taking the, the joint out of its natural um actual out of its natural range um and if they're arthritic already then we're just making that pain so much worse so um and always always and i can say this as an owner that used to let their dogs slide all over the kitchen floor please um even if you don't think your dog's got arthritis please um please try and limit that because um as i say all of these things they all add up as to how um how how, how much that that can con condition can progress <clears throat> so as i say I, i've got an ebook um which i go into um so it covers a lot of the things i've already spoken about but it goes into a lot more detail but there are other things that we can start to think about as owners so start to think about their diet their nutrition so how you know how, how good is their diet and that is also related to obviously their, their body weight so start to think about that there are so many supplements out there um, and again that's a whole other topic um, I would just be the kind of two things I kind of tend to say to um, say to owners is um, it's, it's an unregulated industry so um, providers of supplements can pretty much make claims or that aren't necessarily going to be that proven so um try and go for um sort of quality um over quantity um most evidence at the moment suggests that omega-3s have um, there's the most evidence that that has the most benefit for dogs there are loads of others um and if you are putting your dog on any form of supplement i'm not anti them i use them myself with, with baxter but just try and you don't you know if your dogs if you suddenly put your dog on say on metacam and then you suddenly put oh, on you know, put some humors and omega-3s and turmeric and all these other things then if you start to see an improvement in your dog then you won't know what it is that's making that improvement so try and introduce these things one at a time give them a chance to to kick in so then you can really start to see um, what is what is actually making the difference um as I say start to look at the, your home environment exercise again a massive conversation <clears throat> um, and as I say physios can really really help you guide you here so you know the type of exercise and the type of routine that your dog has um, there was a time a few decades ago that if a dog or a person had arthritis then you were meant to just rest but actually you want the dog moving it's just that you want them moving in the right way and the right type little and often basically um, so really starting to look at look at the, the exercise to say the type of exercise you know where does your dog spend the week sometimes dogs are you know in doggy daycare during the week um you know what kind of exercise are they doing there um and then you know looking at the routine at the weekend we quite often refer to them as, as weekend warriors you know the dogs sometimes maybe do 10 15 minute walks during the day maybe once or twice and at the weekend it's like okay let's go out on a two-hour walk you know we really want to enjoy our weekend with our dogs um, you know some dogs can cope with that but a lot of dogs can't you know if they've been very sedentary at the beginning it, during the week and then they suddenly go out health for leather at the weekend we can actually be doing more harm than we actually realize so really start to look at, at things like that and say physios can really help you with uh, guide you how does your dog get in and out of the car um, when a dog is jumping out of the car they're actually putting four times their body weight through the front end so again if they're really uncomfortable here we're just making that pain worse so really start to look at things like that sleep quality you know now we've um, with lockdown people have been around their homes um, obviously a lot more and around their dogs a lot more and if you've got a busy household you know is your dog getting enough sleep you know again if a dog is healing as it's same with us humans you know the more the better quality sleep we get the better um, and enrichment again lots of different enrichment ideas it's been proven that enrichment um, can actually help um, reduce pain as well as a, as a distraction so all these things that can really really help from a, from a lifestyle perspective <clears throat> and uh, I, whenever I um, whenever I speak to owners, uh, you know, any clients and what have you, I always could say, look, you know, we've, we're working as a team. You know, I, I will spend maybe an hour or so with your dog, but really, the, the majority of time is spent with either the owner and, and you know maybe a variety of other people that are taking care of your dog. So 
if you know if you go through a process of working out that uh, you know you find out that your dog has got um has got arthritis and then you know you maybe you're speaking to a physiotherapist or another type of therapist and they're saying actually we're suggesting that you do xyz to really help your dog then you know make sure that you're communicating that to all of the people that are potentially involved um with taking care of your dog so you know, if your dog goes to daycare um, and you know your physio suggested that you know if they have a certain type of exercise um, regime but then when they go to doggy daycare that you know none of that's straight out the window they're out there they're rolling around they're having fun they're rolling they're having you know they're having a great time massive high impact play then you know if you're if you're doing all this great work within the home or you're seeing you know you're paying for different sort of different services but then it's all being undone at Dobby daycare so these are just things to start to think about and you know again if your dog is maybe a dog walker <clears throat> is going out you know start to really have a conversation with them about the type of exercise that you know your dog should be having again i know this is always sometimes easier said than done but these are just things that i wanted to kind of just put in people's minds um and you know if your dog regularly goes to um to the dog groomers um and you know that you say potentially there's an issue with their elbow or their um their hip or their back or what have you then you know make sure you communicate with them so if the dog groom is going for a certain part of their body and then all of a sudden you know they the, the dog responds um you know it's, it's 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 kind of just making sure that everyone is as that whole cliche of you know singing off the same song sheet just so everyone is is aware of what's going on so hopefully i've probably spoken a little bit longer than i should have done so so i can take questions but you know hopefully this is kind of like giving you some food for thought um so you can start to now sort of start to look at your dog start to see how they're moving start to see how they're behaving you know having in our minds that if your dog is diagnosed with arthritis then you know it's not the end of the world dogs and dogs can very successfully live with the condition it's just making the right kind of modification so um but it's not ignoring it you know if you see such sea changes please don't ignore it you know if it's left and it's left for you know weeks months years um it can be so so painful and, and I, I it breaks my heart when i sit if i'm driving along and i see these old dogs you know being dragged along and it's just like oh you know that dog needs help um so it's and it's very much a holistic approach you know we're not you know if your dog say has an issue with the hip it's not that we just look at the hip we look at the whole body and we look at the whole environment for your dog to give them the best chance and it's not just about money a lot of the things that i suggest to my owners they it's either low cost or no cost um so don't feel like it's all about having to throw money at things um don't you know don't feel like oh i just pay that money and it's it, the problem's fixed the time and the effort and the thought that you do and you know if you've come into a webinar this evening to to learn about um to learn about how you can help your dog then obviously you're putting that thought in already so um you know really think about you know especially at this time in this climate we want to use our money wisely so um as i say so don't don't feel like it's always got to be about the money as i say sometimes the simplest things are actually the most effective and um you know so hopefully i haven't tried to i didn't want to paint too much of a, a gloomy picture um as i say be happy because we have our dogs we love them um as i say you're wanting to do the best for them so um so hopefully as i say i've tried to give a bit more of a, a positive spin on something that can be a little bit of a scary um topic um, so again, I know I've spoken for almost an hour. Um, if you've got more information, as I say, um, one of the one of the reasons I ended up doing this webinar was because I wrote an ebook in lockdown because I thought, oh my god, I can't help physically dogs for myself at the time. So I, I put this ebook together, which is basically all you know, say some of the stuff I've already spoken about, but going into more detail and the things that I always tell all of my owners. So um, if you want to um, if you want to buy that, then there's a website there. Um, Sometimes some of the people that have bought my ebook have then wanted to have a bit more of a conversation with me and maybe they don't live close, uh, close to me. So we've had an online consultation, so that's available. Um, but also if you want to, um, if you want to have a one-to-one -one with me and, and I can help really, um, put together a bespoke plan for you, then that's obviously available as well. So please let me know. Uh, and lastly, before I take some questions, um, uh, as I say, last year I did um, a research project on how physiotherapy can help dogs with osteoarthritis, and that's really available on my on my website. So if you wanted to take a look, then that's all the information is there for you. <clears throat> um, and I've got lots of case studies and testimonials as well on my website. So that's it. Hopefully, I've left. A, I haven't bored you all too much, and um, I can start to take some questions. So I'll have a look in the chat 
Okay, so I've got a question here. Is drooling a sign of pain? Um, it, yes, it might be. Um, if it's drooling, it depends kind of, I guess, let me just actually, let me just see if I can. Um, I can unmute, there we go. Um, so in case people want to ask. So um, oops, let me just go back to. The question. Um, so yeah, so is drooling a sign of pain? It it, it can be, but it, 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 it dogs don't tend to do just one thing. If they're in pain, they'll probably do a combination of things. So I would say it kind of depends on the context of that. But um, but yeah, the answer is yes, it can be. Um, would you recommend any supplements? I get asked this all the time actually, and it's really. Uh, as I say, as I kind of alluded to a bit earlier on, it's it's quite a difficult conversation or quite a, a difficult question to actually um, uh, to answer because there are so many. Um, but what I would say is definitely maybe potentially speak to your vet or you know a physio can point you in the right direction. Um, they, they don't tend to necessarily do any harm. It's just how much good are they doing? Um, and as I say. If you're going to put a dog on a supplement, I wouldn't put them all on a whole load. I would just try one at a time. Um, say, eggs, does she? No, but she can't. They're not allowed to. They're not allowed to. Uh, and then uh, Mandy was asking, Duga has bad arthritis in his carpal joint. He limps all the time. If he walks on roads and not grass, he can't put his foot down. Yeah, I've been advised for him to have physio again to build up muscle. Yeah. Uh, I would have thought he would already have good muscle tone for the day. He wasn't keen on hydrotherapy. He's done that. He has poor uh, uh, It's not overweight here. Um, I can't let him play with other dogs. I can fit. Yes, physio can work. Um, it can absolutely work. It, you know, physio can help build your. Uh, so this is Nandy. Um, yes, absolutely. I would say so. You, you don't have to get in contact with me, but um, I would definitely, um, I would definitely have a conversation with the physios to how they can help you. There are, um, I don't know how old your dog is, but um, I would say yes, definitely revisit it. Not every dog likes um, hydrotherapy. Mike Jensen, he he hated it. You know, he, the guy that did the hydrotherapy said, I can't believe a golden tree who doesn't like water. But you know, not all dogs like it. Um, there's the treadmill, so there's underwater treadmills they can go on, or there's the swimming pool. So. Um, um, so yeah, so I would say to Mandy, yes, absolutely. He might not like it because it made his leg work. Sorry? Oh, I can't remember if someone was saying something there. Um, is there a particular flooring that is better for dogs? We have five dogs and children, so have them as easy to clean as I know it's not great for dogs. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, I mean, as I say, what I would say about the flooring is, you know, look around where, where your dog spends most of their time and you'll probably find that, that the dog will gravitate to that area because they know that they can get up more easily. And sometimes it's just more comfortable for them to lie on it. So um, basically you want to look for anything that's non-slip. Um, vet bed can be quite useful. Um, you can get lots of, sort of anti-slip runners as well that you can put around. So um, uh, there is, there is, yeah, I would say have a look around, but basically you're looking for non-slip. Uh, a question from Sally. Adam talked about strengthening the dog's front legs by doing things like walking backwards to help protect them from OA. Are there any other suggestions or techniques you would use? Yes, there are. Um, and I... I don't like to keep have like blanket um, exercises because it's very much dependent on the dog. So we want to make sure that we're giving them something that is not going to be able to, is not actually going to hurt them more. So um, yes, there are lots of things you can do. And I would say, say speak to um, speak to a therapist to, to, that they can give you some specific um, uh, activities for your dog. What do you think about using neoprene supports on joints with arthritis? Um, I don't know whether you mean, um, the things that you put on their feet um or whether the the kind of like you can you can get sort of like support boots are really useful um so if a dog um has got really bad arthritis in their in their digits um boots can be really helpful for them to to give that extra bit of support i don't know whether that was the question that someone was asking like getting them used to it i think that's i think that's it for questions uh adam i don't know if i've missed any or someone else has said something else. Hey. And I think, I think that you would be a bit like. Should I stop him jumping off the bed and get him back? 
he has even had laser treatment on his front leg. Um, yes, I would definitely say um, basically stopping impact going through any joint, whether there's arthritis or not, is always a good thing. So, um, you know, jumping into the car isn't quite so bad, but it's the jumping out that's the bigger problem or jumping down on anything that's really, really steep. So all you can do to realize that is always a good thing. In requires his back legs to propel him, whereas coming down, he's going on his front legs. Yeah, but Chapel Farm did say about like that's where to stop him from going on the trampoline because of the impact when he was mm. doofing down. I can hear someone talking, but I don't know whether you're talking to me or whether you're talking amongst yourselves. I wasn't sure. <laughs> so I don't know if anyone else has got any other questions. Happy to take them if you have. No. Okay, Adam, I don't know if you wanted to say any other words or anything. I don't know whether I should unmute you. Yeah, so hopefully you can hear us now. Can you hear? Yeah, yeah. you can hear everything. Yeah. Perfect. Um, brilliant. I mean, that was that was brilliant. Thank you very much for, for I mean, even I was writing those down and scribbling away in, uh, in the background as well. So hopefully everybody got loads of good information from that um where's the best place for people to get in touch with you if they want any extra additional help or training is it is, is there an easy website to get to or yeah if you my, so my website is uh physio my dot dog so i just um hopefully you can, everyone can still see my screen here um so yeah i've got loads of information on on the website as i say so if people want to so by the ebook that's on there um so if they want to get in touch with me if they want to read um different case studies and um another kind of bits and pieces i've got on there there's a whole load of info on there so um so yeah so that's all of it on there so it's it and i'm also on facebook so if you uh, search on physio my dog on facebook um i post not every day but i normally try and post three or four times a week on there and a variety of different case studies and another sort of learning content as i say i like to sort of share as much information as i can with owners so um so yeah, so there's lots of info on there. Perfect. Uh, so the, the last thing really is just to say thank you very much for, for um, giving up your evening to help us out and, and give us information about, about osteoarthritis. Um, I have unmuted everybody. So if anybody is uh, still muted, feel free to unmute yourselves. And it'd be lovely if you could all give a, a, a bit of a, um, a group. Thank you to Harriet for, for um, go through that with us. Oh, well, thank, thank you, Harriet. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Thank you, Adam. If you need any information, um, Harriet is contactable, website, Facebook as well, if you have any questions. Otherwise, thank you very much for attending. Your um, recording will be sent out as soon as it's uploaded and as soon as it's uh, humanly possible to send out to you. And obviously, if you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to either get in touch with me and I'll send it on to Harriet or send it on to uh, Harriet directly. And I'm sure she'll be able to help you out from there. Yeah, no worries. <clears throat> okay, I'm just going to stop recording. <clears throat>